well, it looks like most of you made it back. That's, that's pretty good. <laughs> the uh, brain can only walk, uh, endure as much as the seat. No, the brain can only absorb as much as the seat can endure. Yeah. I think that's how that goes. And uh, we've had uh, a long day so far. And uh, the I don't know about you fellows, but in my whole experience in the church, I can't remember sitting under prophetic leadership helping us understand what the kingdom of God is. I found that's such a blessing this afternoon to sit under Brother Larson's ministry and to help us understand that righteousness that came down through Jesus Christ in earthly form that is available to all of us. And what a beautiful insight uh, he brought to us in, in that. And uh, I don't remember ever anybody, prophetic or not, that ever t attempted to try and uh, help us understand what the fullness of the gospel is and what's contained therein. And uh, Jim, you did it. You did it, and God had 10 minutes left over. I, the, uh, you did a yeoman's job. I sure appreciate that. The uh, first two scriptures, I just wanted to uh, emphasize again, why are we doing this? Is this just another program that Kevin or Jim or President Larson came up with that will go the way of the dodo, like all programs seem to do? Um, I would suggest no. Um, as uh, has been pointed out before in uh, section R145, the first revelation of the church, we were told to study to understand the fullness of my gospel, which today we did. We responded to what God asked us to do. Do you apprehend the significance of that? When all else fails, follow the directions. When all else fails, follow the instructions, follow the directions. What's the promise that goes with that? I hope the mics are ready to go because I want to make this interactive. So what is the promise that goes if we study to understand the fullness of the gospel? Right after that, it's right there in front of you. The kingdom of God awaits our response and make ready for the bridegroom. So the kingdom was waiting for us to do this. I think that's a, a profound understanding. Um, the second scripture, R150, you, my faithful, have not as yet fully understood the purpose for which I have called you forth in these last days. Ouch. Kind of an admonition there, isn't it? You have brought renewal to my church, but have not fully grasped the vision of the building up of my kingdom. My coming still awaits the establishment of my Zion. So what are we studying here today, this right now? The vision of the kingdom. <clears throat> Is this subject matter in this document familiar to anybody? Alex, Andrew? Do you realize... Jim, was it, when was it? Uh, do you remember when we, was it uh, October of 2013? Yes. This document was published and we reviewed it in the October Priesthood Assembly. I, maybe it was a conference that we had. What? I don't remember which, which year that was. We had an October conference. It was that year. Was that year? Yes. And... Uh, because the Lord, we recognized at that point that the Lord had told us this, that we needed to uh, more fully grasp the vision of the kingdom. The, uh, because I'm rather hoarse and have these allergies, I'm going to um, try and get somebody to volunteer to read today. Is there somebody that uh, would like to do that for me? You can do it from your seat. There you go. Why don't you pick up there uh, after that R-150 where, where it starts out Joseph Smith, Jr. And I'm going to probably interrupt you numerous times here, so don't be offended when I stop you because I want to make sure we understand what the Lord's talking about here. What? Start with Joseph Smith. 
start there. Joseph Smith, Jr., the first prophet of the Restoration Movement, bore the full following testimony upon which the entire movement began. I must do as James directs, that is, ask of God. I at length came to the determination to ask of God. I was answered that I must join none of them. They draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. What's unique about that statement? Any parts of it or the entire statement? Uh, I'm interested what you think about it. Certainly didn't fit the mold of existing thinking. Okay, let's let's try, wait for the microphone to get to you. Um, do we have two mics going around still? So raise your hand if you want to say something. Why don't you repeat yourself if you would, Lane, so that we get it uh, on. Uh, live stream. All of these remarks really don't fit the mold of the thinking of the day. In other words, uh, Joseph was not speaking with any concern for PR. You wouldn't tell people uh, in other faiths, uh, I was answered that I must join none of them. That was offensive to a lot of people in the 1830s. Okay. What else, Jack? Well, it sets the framework that God felt the need for the restoration of his church. He felt the need, there was a need for the restoration of his church. Over here, uh, Eric, keep your hand up, Bob. Well, this apparently Joseph had done that nobody else had ever thought of. He took the Bible literally, and he asked God what he should do. And then he went from there. Do we believe that God will reveal the answers to our prayers? That power of revelation that the restoration movement came upon is absolutely essential to our understanding of us as a body of Christ. As James directed, if, if you have a question, ask of God, for he giveth to all men liberally. No, I just, is that on? I just uh, just wanted to add to that. I believe in, in the next verse, and you think here about our, our brother Joseph. He was with such unwavering faith that he stepped forward. And as it says here, but also with his determination, and as mentioned earlier there, with his perseverance to do what he did, but then to carry it onward, to press onward with it. He listened for an answer, didn't he? Ted, you were going to make a comment? Just that it seemed to me that he also recognized, uh, perhaps unlike all the rest of them, the true power that was in, in the words that he was reading. And... Um, as everyone else said then, he acted upon the, those, those words. And so that was, that was it. Thank you. The thing that we haven't really talked about here is Lane alluded to or directly spoke to that it was a bold thing to say to join none of them. And it might have been offensive to the other religions of the time. I think something unique here we also need to take into consideration was Joseph's age at that time. You know, we think it has to be a man that's of mature age to get the people straightened out. He started with the youth, and uh, look what came with that. Didn't have years of things he had to correct, did he? <laughs> uh, let's go to Fred over here. I saw his hand next. In the last uh, sentence, having a form of godliness, right before that it says their creeds are an abomination. And uh, really uh, some other words could have been added, their creeds, their tenets, their practices, their assumptions, their interpretations. I think all those are an abomination, and we don't quite live up to that. I, one endeavor is a really a way to kind of smooth out the, uh, 
the way of looking at that so that we're on the same page. But in practice, there's a lot of things that we pull right in from the Protestant world, the Christian world, and we don't do much uh, different than than any of them. So we we're not we don't have a good awareness of what actually is an abomination to God. Uh, it didn't remind you of the story of David and Goliath. You know, David was anointed at a young age um, to be king, but he had such great faith that when the Philistines come and, and Goliath challenged anyone, you know, uh, to fight him, they, the men, they couldn't, uh, they didn't have the faith, you know, to go out there and, and depend on God. And here a young man with a, a sling and a rock said, well, you know, you guys ought to be ashamed of yourself. God will deliver us from this. And he went out there with faith, you know, in a, a sling and a rock and defeated this giant. Nobody else could or thought they could. And uh, here, here Joseph Smith Jr., Lord had been waiting for somebody for a long time to have the faith to come to him and ask him um, a question uh, pertaining to that scripture, to take that scripture literally and have the faith and ask the Lord, what should he do? And, and I think uh, Brother Permit made a good point. Their creeds were an abomination. I didn't put that in there because I didn't think that was the important part because there's a lot of creeds that are out there. And the problem with those creeds is they denied the next two points, okay? They drew near to him with their lips, but their heart was far from them. We can keep all the law we want. Depart from me, you never knew me, is a phrase we never want to hear. I've done all this stuff in your name, Father. I've done all this stuff in your name, Father. No. It needs to be in the heart. We need to know the Holy Spirit. We need to know Jesus Christ in our soul, in the depth of our very being. So that was something that was missing at the day. Um, let's, Andrew's had his hand up, then we'll, we'll go over to Jerry and then maybe over to Bob. I was just going to say that I um, hope that this isn't too much of a warning to us um, not to do the same thing. The power that's been restored in our priesthood in this church, the fact that we have a prophet that's leading us with uh, revelatory guidance directly from God, um, the the work that we're doing to build the kingdom, uh, we can't take it for granted um, and let this be a warning to us not to deny uh, the holiness and the power that's resident in his church. Amen. It's, it's that um, unity, that oneness, that coming into that relationship with Jesus Christ so he dwells in our heart, so he takes up residence and has space and controls what we do. Um, that's, I believe, what that statement says. Jerry? That, uh, but have their hearts, but their hearts are far from me. That's a danger for us, too. What he wants is an acceptable offering, and that is a broken heart and a contrite spirit of his service. Amen. And he can only reside in a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Bob? I was just going to say that's exactly what the Pharisees had done their entire lives. They drew near to him with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. They went out of their way and spent great amounts of time studying the Bible and the scriptures and what have you, and then they begin to add to it and to add to it and to add to it until they got to the point where there were so many laws that they were trying to obey that they didn't know what the gospel even said. Whitewashed sepulchers come to mind? Something like that, yeah. yeah. And that's kind of the danger that we're running is we're beginning to add to a lot of things that the Lord didn't necessarily say. And I don't say that in condemnation of anybody. I'm just need pointing to be careful. out the fact that we need to be very, very careful of what we're doing. We need to be careful of the traditions of men. And uh, Brother McCannon talked about um, kind of a, what, what do you use, Jim, hierarchy of authority? What's the standards of authority? And the very high authority is the theocratic law of the scriptures. 
you know, we you, we can talk about uh, the uh, GCRs, um, general conference resolutions. We can talk about um, our little manual that talks about policies and procedures, and we can talk about a lot of things. Um, but we need to understand that his word is truth, and uh, always look to that. Uh, hence, Jim's and um, superscripts and his references um, to every statement almost that was made in those summaries on the fullness of the gospel. So if you really want to understand what Jim shared with us this afternoon, take the time and go back and read those scriptures that support that because that will bring that word into your heart because that Jesus came to write the word in our heart, okay, that it might become flesh. And uh, uh, that's done through the power of the, uh, of the Holy Ghost that, that we've been given. And um, the, the, the last sentence here, having a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. What's that mean? Ted? I think it means that they were saying some of the right things, but they weren't completing the thoughts uh, as Christ and as God would have them to complete that. So uh, they, had a, they had a form of godliness, but they were denying the power that went with the extended portion of, of many of those thoughts that they began. The, um, I need to keep moving here, because, or I'll never get through this, but the thing yeah. that I think that we need to pick up from this is, is a priesthood is the understanding of the Holy Ghost. How many times have I heard I've tried and I tried and I'm still a sinner? Kevin, these, uh, these statements assure us that uh, the uh, ancients knew how to do political spin too. This isn't something we invented in our day and time, although we sure uh, practice it widely. Are we stuck in our sin and can't get out of it? It's up to us? What's the word repentance mean? Do we deny the power of the Holy Ghost when we continue in our sins? You see, we've been given the gift and the power of the Holy Ghost that we might learn to walk in the pathway of Christ, in his righteousness. That's what makes it his righteousness, is because it's through that gift that was given to us, the power of the Holy Ghost, part of the Godhead that resides within us, to overcome sin. And when that has been received in our life, the power to overcome and to accomplish all things is there. Do we understand the powers of heaven that were brought to earth? And that righteousness that comes only through the powers of heaven, the gift and power of the Holy Ghost. For example, I, I smoked three packs of cigarettes a day for years and years, even after I first came into the church. And I tried desperately to quit a few times. But when I finally sat down and asked God to help me quit, it was simple. And who gets the glory then? To God be the glory. Amen. So you're going to keep reading here, so don't give up the mic. <laughs> Within these statements, we find the important nature of the restoration and its transforming power in the lives of the saints. It points us to the first and great commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. That power was manifest in the early church as the church arose in all its aspects. With the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants bringing awareness to the saints of the fullness of the gospel. Furthermore, it brought the importance of the covenants our fathers made with God and the very nature and power of God himself and his desire to fulfill all his word. In the early revelations, the Lord referred to the church as the cause of Zion 
and Zion being the very kingdom of God. The church is not the destination, but the vehicle Christ built, the cause of Zion, that will bring us to our final destination, the kingdom of God on earth. What is the cause of Zion? The church. The church. How many times was the term cause of Zion used in the Doctrine and Covenants? Four. When was the last time it was used? It was prior to April 6, 1830. Why was it never used again in the Doctrine and Covenants? The cause of Zion, the church had been reestablished, had been established upon the earth. One little side note, not to poke uh, our dear friends at the community of Christ, but the next time it was used in the Doctrine and Covenants was section 156, when women in the priesthood were called. The church had already been established, if that isn't evidence of... Um, it may have been a new church that was being established, I don't know. But um, very interesting little tidbit of history. The cause of Zion is the church. Can the church, can Zion and the kingdom come without the church? No, it cannot happen. So keep reading there. And when we get done with this page, I'll let you hand off to somebody else to read. Okay. The authority of the priesthood was restored along with the keys to the kingdom of God here on earth. The understanding that celestial glory, the kingdom of God, was intended to be here on the earth now was the central theme of the church the Lord restored through Joseph Smith, Jr. A righteous priesthood with those spiritual keys holds the power of heaven in their hands. Though through the ordinances that were restored, the power of godliness was available again to men in the flesh. This permitted the very essence and glory of God, which is his pure love and intelligence, to be available to men and women who were willing to lay down their lives in a spirit of true repentance in exchange for his spirit to dwell within them. Thus, the completed or perfect man has more of the spirit of God and less of his own spirit, the natural man becoming a spiritual man. Do we understand the keys, the powers of heaven that have been placed in your hands? And they can only be exercised in righteousness. We've been given those things. They were restored to the earth. So the power of godliness, the power of the Holy Spirit could be fully manifested again upon the earth. What a beautiful thing that took place. Go ahead. This power of godliness was made possible through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ and by the which he is grace sanctifies us so that we may take upon us the na his name as he is so be aware of the earth. So, Brother Larson's statement on what is the kingdom and the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it's through that good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ, through his atoning blood, through his sacrifice and his grace, we can be sanctified and take upon us his name and become new creatures so that as he is, so are we in this world. How many sermons have you heard that this is kind of a terrible place to live and we do the best we can and when we get to the other side, we'll get our reward and that's where we will live in eternity? Uh -uh. That's not the gospel that we understand that was restored to the earth. Okay? Just to make it real clear. Want to pass off to someone else? I will honor those who respond in righteousness with the powers of heaven, for it will require those powers for the work that lies ahead. Continue to seek the endowment you so eagerly look for, which will only come through the further sanctification of your everyday lives. Continue to be faithful, humble, and unified in your worship and service to me. And, as promised earlier, my Zion will unfold before you. Thus saith the Spirit. Amen. 
as I mentioned last night in, in the words of counsel, um, we are blessed with the prophet of God. And the prophet of God is absolutely essential for bringing about the kingdom. And what greater counsel could we have received than understand that our righteousness um, is necessary for the powers of heaven and uh, that it's only through the further sanctification of our daily lives will that come about. And if we do so and remain unified and faithful and humble uh, in our worship and in our service, Zion would unfold before us. What a great promise that is. Go ahead. Let the bishopric with the temporal law and the first presidency with the spiritual law come together under the celestial law, such consummation making the secular become sacred and culminating in the attainment of the kingdom of God on earth. All this power of heaven, all this relationship with Christ that we've received that we're restored to the earth and the keys. If it remains between our ears, is it worth a thing? When does it become valuable? When it becomes expressed in our temporal lives. It's the only way to express what is done upon us. And I would speculate and postulate and propose to you and believe myself that until it finds expression, it doesn't exist. So don't fool yourselves thinking that because you know that somehow you're saved it needs to find expression the kingdom needs to be expressed upon the earth okay the kingdom of god on earth has particular distinctives that we need to be in harmony with to understand how to abide the law of the celestial kingdom temporal law with the spiritual law come together under the celestial law and fulfill the measure of our creation. These attributes are both individual and corporate. Individually, these attributes are an expression of our unity with divinity and corporately, as they are an expression of our relationship in unity with each other through God and us. The attributes of the kingdom reflect the transformational process and power of the Godhead found resident within our lives. This is the power of godliness the Lord revealed to Joseph Smith Jr. that was missing and needed restoration. Making sense? Okay. Go ahead. Revelation. This is a distinctive, remember. In Christ's church, there is authority to receive God's truth so that man has knowledge of God's commandments. Thus, man must be authorized to receive prophecy and revelation for the whole church. The prophet president of the church is the only one who can receive revelation for the whole church. The church, or the body, has the right to accept or reject, through the government of the church, that spirit of revelation. Once accepted by the body, it becomes scripture and law to the church. That's what differentiates President Larson from the Pope. Okay? Um... When he brings revelation to the church, there's a gospel distinctive within the church that's a check and a balance, and the people have the right to accept or reject it. Once accepted, it becomes law and scripture to the church. I don't know how any of you feel about that, but who's ever brought an inspired message to the church in their ministry? Uh, thus saith the Spirit. Well, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make here. So you, you captured it. Okay. In our ministry, I did that intentionally. In our ministry, we bring sometimes inspired messages to the people that are within the sound of our voice that the Lord wants shared. Is that something that we should write down and copy and send to the whole church? Why? Well, it doesn't apply to them. It was meant for that time and that place and those people. You don't have the authority. You don't have the authority to because we don't have the authority to bring revelation for the whole church. And finally, does the church ever vote on those things that float around out there? 
as being the mind and will of God? No. The, they should be acknowledged by the person that's in charge or other priesthood as being from the Lord. And if it's not, then it should be a serious question within the group that received it. Do we understand that principle? But clearly for the church, um, it can only come through the president prophet of the church, and it has to be voted upon the, by the church to be received as revelation. So, <clears throat> yes, um, hold your hand up. Where is he? Sure. Well, say it again so that everybody could hear what you said. I said, just don't forget the ministry of the presiding patriarch. He may also bring revelation to the church. The uh, Carl, do you want to comment on that? I, uh, I'm not. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I'm not quite uh, uh, certain that that is a uh, a statement that uh, we can uh, stand on or sit on either one. Uh, he, he sure can bring some prophecy and he can bring revelation, but I haven't seen yet where it has been something that has been collective for the total church. I, I mean, I, my history may not have caught up with me yet, but I haven't found that to be true. Thank you. Um, I believe that um, members of the First Presidency, um, uh, the presiding patriarch uh, can bring an inspired message to the church, but it has to come through the prophet and receive his endorsement. I don't believe that there's a single scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants that was brought by anyone but the prophet of the church. Okay? Just to make it very clear. The, um, Yeah, I don't have my Doctrine and Covenants, but I recall that somewhere in that document it says that when you when you speak, when, move, when speaking, when moved upon by the Holy Ghost, it shall be Scripture unto you. And so that is in Doctrine and Covenants. And again, I understand, and I have nothing wrong with what you're saying in terms of we, our, our belief has always been in restoration that only the prophet can bring revelation to the whole entire church. But Paul was not the prophet of the church. Well, we, we've talked about already today uh, an example of uh, the patriarchal order bringing patriarchal blessing to the church and becomes scripture to the individual. And that inspired message may be important to the people in that congregation that received that message. I'm not downplaying that and that God does speak through his priesthood to the people. All I'm trying to define for us is very clear the structure of the church and how important that is in establishing order. Is God a God of order or is he a God of chaos? He is a God of order. He is a God of order. And that order is necessary in his church. It's a distinctive that's absolutely essential. So I've got to keep moving or we'll never get through. So we're going to move on from this topic. Um, if we could keep reading, uh, Josh. So he'll need the mic back. Sorry, guys, if you have questions um, or a statement. Um, maybe on the next one you could slip it in if you want. But uh. <laughs> Go ahead. I, 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 I don't mean to diminish this question, um, but uh, if, if we have a problem with this question, we have a serious problem in the church. Okay? There's only one that can receive revelation to the whole church. And it only becomes revelation to the whole church when the body accepts it as revelation. Okay? Simple statement. We're all given the power of the Holy Ghost, and we can bring inspired messages in our ministry. I'm not diminishing that by making that statement. Okay? I, all I'm doing is defining what becomes law to the whole church. Okay? Behold, I say unto you, the redemption of Zion must needs come by power. 
Therefore, I will raise up unto my people a man who shall lead them like as Moses led the children of Israel. For ye are the children of Israel and the seed of Abraham. And ye must needs be led out of bondage by power and with a stretched out arm. And as your fathers were led at the first, even so shall the redemption of Zion be. Section 100 of the Doctrine and Covenants. You know, um, I read that back in 2005. And uh, I thought about that. And do we realize Zion can't be without a man like unto Moses that will lead us as the children of Israel if, if we accept this as true? Is that a too bold of a statement? Behold, I say unto you, the redemption of Zion must needs come by power. Therefore, I will raise up unto my people a man who shall lead them like unto Moses, led the children of Israel. For ye are the children of Israel and the seed of Abraham, and ye must be led out of bondage by power with a stretched out arm. And as your fathers were led the first, even so shall the redemption of Zion be. Pretty simple statement. <clears throat> when I read that, I thought, you know, I better read about how that worked out for Moses if I'm going to understand how that will work out in the latter days. So I read from Genesis all the way to Joshua. It wasn't a pretty sight. There was murmurings. There, there were all sorts of problems that happened, despite all the miracles that we think of with Moses and how he led the children of Israel and out of bondage by the power of God. But man, they were complaining about the manna that they were receiving. You know, it got to the point where the Lord had to open up the, the ground and squish a bunch of them, if I remember right. Dathan was kind of leading that charge. Um, so I, I think that, it, for me anyway, um, there's a lot that goes into that scripture that, that uh, I think we can learn from. The act of disclosing to the members what was before unknown to them, communication of the truth of God to men, instruction and direction. Through this power of the Holy Spirit, Revelation, we know that it is Christ's kingdom, and on the rock of Revelation, Christ built and directs his church, for he is our sovereign king. In the Our Revelations, we find the pathway God has given us to build his kingdom upon the earth. <coughs> remember, remember, my remnant saints, you are of the chosen few to bring to pass my kingdom in these last days, to whom much is given, much is required. Throughout the revelatory direction given to the remnant church from the prophetic office is that which is required for bringing to pass my Zion and therefore my coming. Read, study, and obey. I'll need to mark the reference to that. Somehow that dropped off of this page, but uh, um, that's been said twice to us now, to read, study, and obey. And um, I think it's important we need to understand that uh, pathway that uh, the Lord is leading us upon. And we can't miss a step, fellas. We can't miss a step. <clears throat> should we stand up and stretch, or should we keep going? Keep going? If your eyes start to dim, I'm going to call on you. So prop them open and hold them open like this. That's the problem with being the, the one that goes last is, uh, like I said, uh, your own brain can only absorb as much as your seat can endure. But uh, they're distinctive to our church and uh, a government within the church. And uh, we're going to talk about that next. God is a God of order. That is why Christ's church has a government to provide structure. The church is a theocratic democracy and is not man-made, but of divine origin. The saints are granted, in special sessions, the privilege to have voice and vote in order to exercise their agency to build up the church. The government of the church is made up of the following. The church without this divinely ordered structure cannot accomplish the work Christ calls her to do. Do we believe this? Can a restoration branch, not affiliated with a greater church, accomplish the building of the kingdom? No. no. Because the whole structure that was divinely ordained needs to be in place in order to accomplish the work. Do we understand that principle? Do we understand the blessing of the time that we live? That since, what was it, 2000 when the church was organized, in 2002 when the prophet came forward, and as those quorums and orders and structure of the church have been put into place, 
the kingdom can come. The kingdom work can be accomplished. Executive. The purpose of the executive branch is to govern God's church in the spirit of Christ, not to rule over men. This authority is only expressed in bringing the spirit of Christ into the lives of men. Priesthood authority of men who have been called of God, as was Aaron, to safeguard the church, represent the executive branch of the church. Prophet, apostles, high priests, patriarchs, bishops, seventies, elders, priests, teachers, and deacons have executive branch responsibility in all their various callings. The true exercise of this authority can only be accomplished in the righteousness of Christ. Man's righteousness is as filthy rags. The calling of men to the priesthood. What's the safeguard in the church so that the executive branch remains clean and pure? The membership has to sustain the call, do they not? Do you see the checks and balances that the Lord has placed in the system? And um, so no man takes this authority upon himself. It's being called of God, as was Aaron, and being approved by the body. Or sustained by the body, if you will. The responsibility of the first presidency to carry forth the work of my church must continue in earnest as time grows short for the building up of my kingdom on earth. Sorry, Fred. Sorry, Jim. <laughs> but that was from the beginning, and it's still true today, is it not? Can they do everything without us? No. No. Their work is accomplished through us. I have set in my church those offices of priesthood necessary to bring to pass the building of my earthly kingdom, even Zion. It is now the duty of every man called to priesthood office to magnify his calling and make preparation before the night comes. Legislative. Hold on. Got a question or statement, one of the two. I just wanted to throw in a little side note there. It's not the uh, uh, main subject of that first sentence in section R148. But it should be something that we perk our ears up on. It says, the time grows short for the building up of my kingdom. When was 148 given? You're going to tell us, hopefully. Do we know? We'll, we'll, we'll let uh, Richard Paris talk over here. He's been straining. Uh, it, for the mic. Look it up, Richard. It was 2004. 2004. April or October? April. April of 2004. You're off the hook, Richard. Thank you. Okay. Legislative. The ministry of the legislative branch is to allow the saints, through common consent, to accept revelation as law to the church, theocratic law or the highest law. Saints are also privileged to use their creativity as an expression of the spirit of Christ, his love, to enact resolutions, democratic laws or lesser law, that are there for the operation of the church and do not conflict with theocratic law. Thus the kingdom finds unity in its expression of the gospel. There's nothing that would excite me more, and I'll share this with you in, in the context of something that actually happened. Um, I forget what year it was, probably three years ago, there was an Iowa reunion. And Brother Ralph, I think you were there and were instrumental in this discussion. You might remember it. Um, Linda Gussman was involved in the discussion. Um, Eric and Samantha Wilson were involved in the discussion. Was Carl there and involved in the discussion? And the question that they were pondering was, in the one, three, five-year plan, uh, we talked about needing a school in Zion. And so when they got back from that reunion, Linda Gussman, Eric, and Samantha Wilson came into my office with Jim Van Cannon and said, is there any reason we can't do that now? Because we think and agree that there needs to be a school in Zion. 
they were somewhat surprised and taken back by our immediate response. Absolutely. Tell us what you're thinking about. And they said, well, let's start with the fact that we have a lot of kids that are being homeschooled today, and can we create a school that can support them in that homeschool ministry? That parents are trying to bring their children where they can come here and one, two, maybe three days a week um, get some support in that homeschooling. What a great way to start a school. And so Eric and Linda and Samantha got, you know, put all the ideas together and uh, presented it to us. Uh, they put it out, uh, notice uh, on the websites. We had uh, invitations and the parents came and uh, gosh, that was in August and in September we had this school called Zions Academy. It was up and running. Am I missing something there, Brother Carl or Ralph? The Holy Spirit, when it moves upon his children, they shouldn't wait for the bishop to say, okay, now is the time to start a school. There needs to be some order to it, but come on in the office and talk about it. Let's move as prompted by the Holy Spirit to use those time and talents that he gave to us to build the kingdom. There are so many ways that our time and talents and treasure can be used for building the kingdom. And we as a priesthood need to be looking for those opportunities and encouraging the people, the body of Christ, to engage in those activities. Okay? That can be done through legislation. That's why I brought it up here. Judicial. The ministry of the judicial branch is to help ensure accountability in order for the church to function and grow. This ministry of accountability is performed in elders' courts, bishops' courts, and high councils, serving as the primary and appellate court system to be used in all cases only as a last resort when labor towards reconciliation has failed. How did that work in those years we went without a church? We did not have it. Chaos reigned. If a particular congregation that we're in and somebody did something that was untoward and it wasn't uh, liked by that congregation, that person could get up and leave that congregation, go to one down the street and cause the same problem down there. And then if, when that didn't go well, they could go to the next one and cause the same problem down there. There was no way for the body of Christ to deal with that. God is a God of order. He placed in his church those things that are necessary to bring about his kingdom. And uh, the judicial aspect is one very important aspect of that. We don't like to talk about it. I prefer that we never have a elder's court or a bishop's court, um, but uh, at times they become necessary uh, to keep order within the church. Executive, legislative, and judicial. Are those important? And where have we ever heard that before? Well, somebody said, uh, where? Constitution. Constitution, right? Do we believe that this country was established by the power of God through the founding fathers? So would it surprise us that the government of the land would reflect the government of his church that allows his church to come forward? It's the land of the covenant that we live on. You had said something about what? Isaiah 33:22. Somebody want to read that? Isaiah 33:22. I didn't put it in here. Somebody have their scriptures with them? Want to look that up? Isaiah chapter 33 verse 22. President Larson referred to Isaiah and his insights into the kingdom. So if anybody finds it raise your hand so that somebody with a mic can okay. bring it to I got you. One. Okay, Craig. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. Oh. He... King, lawgiver, judge. Three aspects of his kingdom that he's in charge of. Right? Executive, judicial, and legislative. legislative, and judicial. All found in that one statement. You can finish it, but I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. 
He will save us. He will save us. But though, that's order to his kingdom. Okay? Very important to understand that aspect of the church. Do we have another volunteer to read? Or are you still good to go? You good to go? Okay. You getting ready to wind down? Uh, I don't know. We got a lot more pages to go. We go to yeah, we, we, we go until five thirty. So I was tempting you with the five o'clock. But go ahead. <clears throat> the body of Christ, the church, the bride. <clears throat> that he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Do we believe that's possible? It's the wedding garments of righteousness that he places upon us. It's preparing the bride for the bridegroom. Who's the bride? Us. The church. The church. Who's the bridegroom? Christ. Jesus Christ. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. So, whose job is it to prepare the church? Priesthood. Priesthood. It's the church's responsibility, is it not? The bride hath made herself ready. It's not going to be some magical thing that's going to come down and be plopped down in front of us and we can all walk in, um, which some of the restoration branches are waiting for. There's a preparatory process that is absolutely essential, and the church has to prepare herself and make herself ready. Do we believe that? Do we understand that as a body? I'd like to tie that with our local assembly. Hold on, wait. If you're going to say more than a couple words that I can't repeat, we'll need the mic. I want to tie that, with, we talked about it before, with R147 that says... Uh, uh, magnify his office, office and calling and make preparation before the night come. All Hebrew weddings were performed at night. It isn't a time to fear. It's a time to look forward for the wedding. Beautiful insight. Beautiful insight. Let's keep moving. Missionary. As soon as the kingdom appears, it becomes missionary oriented, but it's by its very nature. The call to preach the gospel of the kingdom into all the world is heard and responded to. If Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by him, then being valiant in testimony is a requisite to the kingdom. So, who are the missionaries in the church? All of us. Everyone. Boy, the 70 and the 12 should answer that pretty quick. <laughs> Why is that? Why is that? The moment the kingdom appears, and when you become a citizen through baptism and come up a new creature and receive the Holy Ghost, it should be oozing out of every pore, every eye should shine with the love of Jesus Christ and the hope that is dawned upon you, and everything you do should be a testimony of Jesus Christ to the rest of the world. Should it not? Do we teach that? Yes. Yes. Oh, but I thought it was a 70s job. <laughs> <laughs> there are special witnesses, but we're all witnesses. Right? Absolutely. You cannot overstate the missionary function. Why is the kingdom and why is Zion important? Because it's the best missionary tool that God could ever have. It's an ensign. It's an example to the world. Right? So... Even Zion and the kingdom, it's not for us, although it is. It's for the world to draw all men unto God. Very important to understand. Go ahead. More laborers are needed for the harvest. Therefore, greater efforts than ever before are required for your valiant testimony of the saving grace of my son to the world around you. Those called specifically to reach out, mine apostles in 70, must move out in great faith, spreading the word to all who will hear, preparing them for the day when they will come to Zion. Just wanted to brief the 70 and the 12 if you hadn't captured that. Not only, what's the first half of the mission statement? All who will listen. To preach the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ to all who will listen. And 
to prepare and gather a righteous people. Do you get off the hook as a 70 or member of the Quorum of 12 that you don't have to prepare the people? It says that you're also involved in preparing them. So I just wanted to leave that hanging out there as part of the gospel of the kingdom, that it's not just the gospel of salvation we're preaching. We're preaching the fullness of the gospel, which includes the gospel of the kingdom and uh, all its uh, components. And all of us, including 70 and 12, are responsible for that. Go ahead. The work of the Quorum of Twelve and the Seventy should now, more than ever, seek out the lost sheep scattered among this my land of promise. There are many who have been previously faithful to the doctrine and principles of the Latter-day Gospel and will be receptive to the call to come and see the unfolding of my Zion as expressed in the remnant church. Jim, are you awake? Yeah. Um, do you want to take maybe two minutes and talk a little bit about what's happening with uh, on this land? with your, the outreach that's going on in Iowa and in Indiana, and um, because I believe that what we're witnessing is the fulfillment of 153 but, that we just read. So I don't want to go into uh, actual specifics because I don't, we, ha we actually have a lot of friends who are trying to help us. Uh, they <coughs> they uh, understand that we're going and, and doing missionary work and they try to uh, show up before we do and kind of poison the well, if you will. So. Uh, but we have uh, uh, one branch, uh, well, we're, we're getting ready to form a branch in, in Iowa. Uh, right now they have about 12 to 15 members. There are more members that are getting excited about uh, uh, actually uh, forming a branch. Um, we're committed to basically uh, serving them once a week. So if you'd like to go and preach and provide ministry, there's opportunities for you to go. It's not that far. Uh, to, to go. It's probably about two hours or so to drive there. Um, that's one thing. We have some folks in the Northeast that are um, have come to the conclusion that um, the law of inheritance might be the way that succession and uh, of the of the church is actually passed. And so uh, they're desperately wanting to hear the class uh, that Alex has put together on uh, on succession. And there's a possibility of a branch there. That's just one branch. There, there's uh, actually there's two up there, but at least that one branch is a very good possibility for that. Um, we have uh, down in Florida. Uh, there's a number of saints that are down there that we are working with, and there's a possibility of a common point in putting together a, a branch there. The 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 uh, the key in that point is we don't have a priesthood member. We have about 30 members that are in somewhat close proximity to each other, but no priesthood member. So it's a little bit of a struggle and something we're needing to pray about. But in the domestic field, we have a number of places. Uh, social media. Um, we have a, um, uh, a uh, brother that has uh, been watching us, uh, watching our services, uh, believes that, that we understand the fullness of the gospel. And uh, they have a ministry where basically they uh, uh, pull families, or in other words, uh, women, out of polygamy. And there's a possibility for us to be involved in that ministry. And also what we're doing is providing Book of Mormons, or Books of Mormon, I believe is the correct way you say that, uh, with uh, our testimony in them as an alternative to them in, in regards to the RLDS church, because they're coming out of the FLDS church. And um, so and instead of going to the LDS church, uh, we are the alternative to that. So there's a number of things. I could probably go on for a couple of other things, but there's a lot of things that are moving. Uh, there's an awful lot of LDS saints that are looking at us because they don't believe that, uh, for instance, uh, polygamy or exaltation is really the doctrine of the church. And, of course, we don't either. So that, that aligns. So there's a lot of really wonderful uh, ministries that are uh, happening right now that uh, are exciting. Thank you, Jim. I just wanted to uh, make clear uh, the exciting things that are going on in our missionary uh, outreach in this church that are happening today that are bringing fr and bearing fruit. Um, how many of you that aren't receiving the moments with the master took the time to talk to Stacy Dieterker, Cindy Patience, or um, Artis Nordine. 
one. There were a lot of hands that didn't go up when I asked if you were receiving it. I told my wife to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> why, why do I say that's important? Um, because if you're on Facebook, you can post that to your Facebook page and share it with all your friends. If you're not on Facebook, you can send it out when you're prompted to by the Spirit to everybody that you have on your contact list. It's a way to bear your testimony of the positive ministry of Jesus Christ in your life. And it behooves us all to do that and become missionary-minded. Let's go. Spiritual. <clears throat> Apostle Paul spoke of the fellowship of the mystery that God is love and we dwell in him and he in us. And we know this to be true if we love one another as Christ loves us. The power of godliness is thus manifested. Through sacrifice and discipline in your lives, your righteousness will allow you to receive my power, for it will require power from on high to overcome and build up my kingdom, even Zion, in these last days. I'm going to, uh, because of time, um, skip down to the temporal. We've covered a lot of this in Brother Larson's presentation on uh, what the kingdom is and that... Uh, power of holiness, that power of godliness, that uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand and Jesus Christ bringing heaven to the earth and becoming uh, its physical form here upon the earth. And, and we understand that the requirements of citizenship we've talked about, the attributes of citizenship we've talked about, which are the attributes of God, are they not? Is the power of godliness finds reflection in our life. So uh, from Galatians and, and from the Sermon on the Mount, that's where we get the, those attributes of citizenship in the kingdom. And we need to understand that and encourage that in the membership. And um, uh, the, do we believe that God can actually dwell within us? We better. If we don't understand that makes principle, then we're back to 1830. Okay? We need to understand that. If you don't know that God dwells in you, how can you know? How can you know? Go ahead and read this first John chapter four, um, there at the top of page five. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed that lo the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Okay. Can't get much more clear of a statement about that. And um, how do you, you, you know that God dwells in you if you love one another? It's that simple. Um, the ordinances of the power of godliness, we've talked about that at length with, uh, that we hold in our hands as the Melchizedek priesthood in bringing that spirit into the lives of men. We have the authority, and it's only through that authority can that be accomplished. With all that said, and with all that done, what are the holy works that we're required to do to build the kingdom? Um, Brother Larson has said numerous times, um, in meetings that I've been in with the priesthood and meetings that I've been in privately, that it's through the temporal. And that's the only way that the love of God, the hope of Jesus Christ can find expression is through our temporal activities. So is temporal important? Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> we talk about grace and works and the scissors. I love that uh, uh, statement that uh, was made, of, you know, which part of the scissors don't you need? So let's start at temporal. There must be temporal work performed by a people who are willing to be led by grace and by God's Holy Spirit. Therefore wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead and cannot save you. Now wait, there was a church that I drive by every day on the way into the office that says that's not true. right there on the front of the church. 
by grace alone are you saved. Is that true? By grace alone are you saved? Even the King James tells you that. Even the King James tells us that. Can we stand boldly on that principle or should we be embarrassed by it? Stand boldly on the principle. Why is that necessary to stand boldly on that principle? Because it's truth. My wife and I recently went down to uh, Georgia to my son's retirement, and a gentleman approached us at the hotel and made the statement that you do not get to heaven by your works. And I very quickly produced one of our little cards and handed it to him, and I shoved a chair out, and I said, really, let's sit down and discuss this. He took one look at my cards and said, oh, uh, uh, I've got to go. <laughs> <laughs> But the, the reason it's important is because it's not true. And men and women are being deceived in not understanding that truth, and it's so important. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. I, the Lord, am bound when ye do what I say, but when ye do not what I say, ye have no promise. Word of wisdom, healthy lifestyles, Take sleep in the hours appointed unto man. The destroying angels shall pass us by as the children of Israel. Healthy eating, that we shall find wisdom and great treasures of knowledge, even hidden treasures. Do we still believe in the word of wisdom? Yes. Are we sure? Yes. Show me. <laughs> Show me. Where is Loretta Marshall when you need her? Doesn't say you can't have a cookie every once in a while. The uh, is as long as it's gluten free, sugar free, and tastes like the cardboard it came in. <laughs> the uh, but healthy lifestyles is important. I don't mean to make light of it. It's absolutely essential. Um, and how we eat and the promises of that. Do we understand the promises of the destroying angel will pass us by? We've got to remember that our body is the temple of our Savior. So if we're taking stuff in that's going to cause our bodies damage, then we are, in essence, driving him out. That we will find wisdom and great treasures of knowledge, even hidden treasures. And I think of the, the one scripture that says the kingdom is like a treasure hidden in a field. And once you find it, you go sell all that you have to buy it. How are we going to find the hidden treasures if we don't keep the word wisdom? It's a promise that we've been given. So we need to make sure, first of all, that we do it ourselves, and secondly, that we encourage the membership to do it, not as a blunt instrument to beat them to death, but to encourage them to do it based upon the promises. Economic system, United Order of Enoch, consecration, all things common, not a common purse. No poor among them, stewardship principles, tithing, offerings, inheritances, surplus, and storehouse. Boy, did I summarize that, didn't I? <laughs> Is there an economic system to the kingdom? Absolutely. We all agree with that? Is consecration a necessary requirement for the preparation of the bride? Yes. yes. Can you prepare the bride without being consecrated yourself? No. Not adequately. Can you teach something you don't do? It's pretty hard because the people see right through you, won't they? And uh, so uh, uh, we need to make sure that we understand the principles and uh, that we're doers, not tears only. And um, go ahead, uh, I'll keep reading. Verily I say unto you, it shall come to pass that all those who gather unto the land of Zion shall be tithed of their surplus properties and shall observe this law, or they shall not be found worthy to abide among you. And I say unto you, if my people observe not this law to keep it holy, then by this law sanctify the land of Zion unto me, that my statutes and my judgments may be kept thereon, that it may be most holy. Behold, verily I say unto you, it shall not be a land of Zion unto you. Boy, you mean you can actually sanctify your life in the land of Zion by keeping a temporal law? Is that what that says? Through this law, by this law, 
sanctify the land of Zion. President Larson asked me a, a question the other day, and he came into my office and he had some of the reports from the branches. And he said, Kevin, how come we only have a certain percentage of tithe filers? And how come we only have a certain uh, percentage of people that are consecrated in, these, in this branch? And I thought about it for a minute, and I thought about it for a minute, and he, I said, well, we do have one place in the church where we have 100% compliance. Well, where is that? And he said, yeah. it, it's bountiful. And, he, and, and he, I said, why do you think, Brother Larson, do we have 100% compliance at Bountiful? That's required. You can't be there without doing it. It's requirement. Why are we so afraid of that word that it's required? Just think about it. I want to let that sit in for a moment. Andrew? I think there's a an important element to uh, 106 here that I've glossed over time and time and time again, and it kind of clicked when you were reading through it here. Um, my people observe not this law to keep it holy. It's that to keep it holy that I'm latched onto here at the moment. What is our, what do we feel inside when we, when we do our consecration or we do our tithing? Is it a, I gotta. So here we go again. Another another year. I got to sit down and go through my my finances, and it's it's kind of a um, an annoying thing to have to do. Or is it a holy thing? Is it something that we look upon with um, with as much anticipation, perhaps, as we do um, when we come to something like this, or we come to conference, or we partake of the communion emblems? Uh, it's a holy thing. Motivation is important. We need to respond out of that love, that Holy Spirit that has dawned upon us. Um, the bishop has been counseled not to force the people into this. They need to do it because they want to, because the Spirit has dawned upon them. Um, keep reading, uh, if you would, the next couple of scriptures. Further obedience to the celestial law and the law of consecration <laughs> is... Okay, there it is. And the law of consecration is a necessary requirement for the preparation of the bride. Even though wars and rumors of wars, political unrest and moral decay are all around you, be not discouraged, for lo, I am with you to the end. My work will not be frustrated, and be assured you are among those chosen to bring to pass my kingdom in these last days. Do we believe it? Okay. Good. It's a requirement. There's that word. It doesn't say it's optional. It doesn't. A requirement. So, how do we make it a requirement? The Lord makes it a requirement. We only respond to what He's asked us to do, is it not? It's the theocratic law of the church. Uh, Brother Don? We already did make it a requirement. We raised our hands and voted that Section 151 would be a law unto the church and was the mind and will of God. It is a requirement. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Living debt free. Suppressing unnecessary wants, creating increase in surplus, sharing abundance and substance with those in need. Think of your brethren like unto yourselves, and be familiar with all, and free with your substance, that they may be rich like unto you. But before ye seek for riches, seek ye for the kingdom of God. And after ye have obtained a hope in Christ, ye shall obtain riches, if ye seek them. And ye will seek them for the intent to do good, to clothe the naked, and to feed the hungry, and to liberate the captive, and administer relief to the sick and the afflicted. Are we of a church of abundance? Are we a church that have the powers of heaven at our disposal, which are infinite? Or are we a church of scarcity and of sackcloth and ashes? Abundance. Abundance? Anybody disagree with that? No. 
Absolutely. God is a God of abundance, and he showers upon his people. Book of Mormons, how many times have you read that in the Book of Mormon? When the people did what he asked, what happened? They prospered. When they fell away, what happened? They were delivered up. They had no promise. So why is living dead free important? takes you out of bondage. If you don't control your debt, it will control you. If you're paying an interest rate to a bank, is that money that's being used for God or is it being used for the kingdom? Or is it being used for the bank? Okay. It's a commandment. It's a commandment. Um, President Larson has reinforced to me numerous times of late how important this is, haven't you, President Larson? Debt free. Now is the time. Gathering. Those that hear his voice, his elect, the house of Israel, gathering of Judah to Jerusalem, gathering of Israel to Zion, the new Jerusalem. Only in community can the kingdom of God find full expression. Oops. Somebody put that in red. Why do you think that was? Because it's important. Because Jesus said it, and it's a red letter. <laughs> the, um, he wanted to gather, didn't he? He wanted to gather his people together uh, under his wings as a hen gathered with their chicks. When you picture Zion and that Holy Spirit dawns upon you, what do you see? Is it mixed in with Babylon? Absolutely not. It can't be, because he won't be able to receive it unto himself. So community is where the kingdom of God can find full expression with the laws of holiness being kept and expressed one to another. Does that mean that the missionaries can't go out in the world? Absolutely, it doesn't mean that. I'm talking about the fullness of the expression of the kingdom. Now, hopefully, when the missionaries go out in the world and they talk about the gospel of the kingdom, they can have something to point to and say, come and see. Come and see the kingdom of God where people live together in righteousness. Brother Don. I've had a number of people say, well, I don't want to go to Zion or to Independence. They're all fighting in there. And I said, I always respond with, yeah, we need righteous saints like you to help clean us up. Amen. I want to keep reading. As an ends into the world and a demonstration that man can live together in peace and harmony with his neighbor, exercising stewardships, utilizing inheritances, and not being unduly influenced by Babylon, it is necessary to provide for close community living. Stop. What's that term mean highlighted there and underlined? What's close community mean? Where have you ever heard the term close used before? Communion. Close, we're close communionists, aren't we? Think about that in terms of community. Okay? I think that term was used specifically by God for a reason, to help us bring understanding of what community is and uh, the purity of it. And, and uh, So go ahead. To that end, as it has been revealed previously at the Kirtland Assembly of 2004, preparation for a community of my people should be developed utilizing land in eastern Jackson County. So, R-150, given a long time ago, is an ensign to the world. That's, what, that's the whole purpose of it. And a demonstration that man can live together in peace and harmony, expressing the fullness of that understanding of God's economic system. What a beautiful thing. You know what? That's one thing we've responded to that we've done, isn't it? Chuck went up for, praise God. You know, we have the abundance and the ability to accomplish it. Go ahead. Those of celestial glory are they who are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly place, the holiest of all. Do we understand that's part of the definition of celestial glory and those that are in celestial glory? 
in Section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants? It's an interesting definition. House of Israel, as you prepare the bride to meet the bridegroom, other events must be considered to unfold. The House of Israel must be restored, and a continued understanding of what that means and how it will come to pass should continue to be explored. Remember to seek for light and truth wherever it may be found. Now let each man of this order utilize to the fullest extent his unique calling as a father to the church. And when bringing together all those ministries and duties called for in section 125, 3 to 5, the church will be mightily blessed. Especially needed this day are those special blessings called patriarchal blessings and, if so led, the designation of tribal lineage to bring awareness that you are priestly participants in the restoration of Latter-day Israel. Stop. Uh, how many patriarchs do we have in the room? Raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Obviously, that's speaking directly to the patriarchal order when you're giving patriarchal blessings, that it's important to the Lord of Soled to bring that lineage forth because it's important to those that you're bringing that blessing to. And um, that's how important this is to God about the gathering of the tribes. I asked uh, in a uh, meeting such as this and passed around, I think Fred Pimin had put together the spreadsheet for me, um, and listed all the tribes, and I asked each person to put their name down if they knew what tribe they belonged to, what it was. And there were seven tribes represented in, in a meeting like this. I can't remember which one it was. I don't know if Fred's here. I don't see him. If he remembers which time we did that. But uh, um, we had seven tribes represented. The gathering's taking place, and we're not even aware of it. The Lord wants us to become acutely aware of it. Go ahead, John. Ephraim, behold, the Lord requireth the heart and a willing mind, and the willing and obedient shall eat the good of the land of Zion in these last days, and the rebellious shall be cut off out of the land of Zion, and shall be sent away, and shall not inherit the land. For verily I say that the rebellious are not of the blood of Ephraim, wherefore they shall be plucked out. Why would the Lord tell us that? What does Ephraim have to do with anything? It's Ephraim's call to sound the trumpet in Zion and to call the people and push the people together from the four corners of the earth. Do we understand that is a role of Ephraim? Do we understand that this church is primarily made up of Ephraim? What was the first thing that Moroni shared with Joseph in September of 1823? He quoted Malachi about turning the hearts of the children to the fathers and the hearts of the fathers to the children in the fulfillment of prophecy. So you see, God's promises are all across time and his words don't come back to him void. And we need to understand this and what it means for us as a church. Levi, thus saith the Spirit to my servant W. Kevin Romer, it has been revealed that your inheritance is from the tribe of Levi, and you are a firstborn son of Aaron. Thus you have claim on that long-awaited fulfillment laid down in sections 68 and 104 of our Doctrine and Covenants. You shall have the prerogative to serve with or without counselors. You have served selflessly and worthily as the presiding bishop in the restoration of my church through your Melchizedek ministry and are now called to serve as an Aaronic high priest, the president of the Aaronic priesthood, with greater than ever responsibility for the temporal affairs of the church and bringing to pass my earthly kingdom, even Zion. I hate to put those things in there when it talks about me, but I wanted to point out that Levi is now restored in the priesthood leading the Aaronic priesthood. So we have Ephraim in its place and now Levi in its place. Do we realize the fulfillment of prophecy that has been in the church for so long has taken place in our lifetime? What a blessing, what a joy that should bring to our souls. In this day of world chaos, political unrest and moral decay, it is imperative that we be very strong in our faith. Even though through our faith we are saved by grace, remember that it is through our holy works we demonstrate the depth of our faith. 
we shall be tempted and tried in the days ahead. But if we remain obedient to the commandments and Latter-day Council, the end will be glorious, Zion will be, and our Lord will return to claim his own. Let it be so. Praise the Lord. What a wonderful promise that is. The, uh, I'll let you guys read. Well, let's go ahead and read it. We might go five minutes over, but that's not going to hurt us. We've endured this long. We can endure to the end. Journey's End, the visible community. But the incarnate Son of God needs not only ears or hearts, but living men who will follow him. That is why he called his disciples into a literal bodily following and thus made his fellowship with them a visible reality. In order that they might enjoy that fellowship with him, the disciples must leave everything else behind and submit to suffering and persecution. Yet even in the midst of their persecution, they receive back all they had lost in visible form, brethren, sisters, fields, and houses in his fellowship. The church consisting of Christ's followers manifests to the whole world as a visible community. Here were bodies which acted, worked, and suffered in fellowship with Jesus. In the Christian life, the individual disciple, member, and the body of Christ, church, belong inseparably together. All this is confirmed in the earliest record of the life of the church in the Acts of the Apostles. They that believed were of one heart and soul and had all things in common. Zion is a literal place where the glory of God the Father dwells within those who have been given celestial glory. The city takes on the attributes of God the Father because he dwells within all who are there. God's plan has always been for the eternal life of man. Furthermore, he designed his creation to have joy. This cannot be accomplished until the process of becoming complete, perfect, occurs, which will yield a people who have sacrificed all to become the pure in heart, being filled with charity, the pure love of Christ, the very essence of God himself. Sacrifice is the only way this true love of Christ can find expression. The wonder is that once you are filled with the pure love of Christ, sacrifice, as defined by man, is no more because, if done in love, it is no longer a sacrifice, but joy. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? This last chart, um, I, I uh, just want to go over briefly with you. You have the fundamentals of the fullness of the gospel uh, at the top of the chart. We have... at. Uh, after the order of Melchizedek, the spiritual of the order of Enoch, which is temporal, the order of the Son of God, which is all things are spiritual. I believe in that. You capture that from section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants if you're wondering where that comes from. Uh, so it's part of the law. And it's the temporal and spiritual coming together in the fullness in the celestial. Um, we're led by a prophet. We have the Melchizedek priesthood, which are the quarriers of the stone, the uh, Aaronic priesthood of the Levitical order, which are the polishers of the stone. The temporal and spiritual need to come together. Can we, temporal, can we temporally build Zion without the spirit? Pardon me? You can build the Tower of Babel, but you can't build the kingdom. With all things spiritual in the spiritual side, can you do it without the temporal works and the sanctification that's required? No. Where does holiness and righteousness dwell? In the combination of those two things. What a beautiful mystery of the kingdom that has been unfolded to us in the coming forth of Zion in these the last days. Whose righteousness is it? Whose church is it? How is it made holy? By God through our holy works, the temporal and spiritual coming together in the celestial. Is there a difference between Zion and the kingdom? Zion is the kingdom. That Joseph brought that to us. Uh, the restoration of Israel. Does that mean over there in the Middle East? Here and there. We are the house of Israel. Consecration. See the two arrows at the bottom? It's to make holy. It's those things coming together. And uh, that's the pathway to righteousness. That's the pathway into the presence of God. That is 
the, if you will, the pathway into the Holy of Holies. And um, that's what we're about, brethren. We've been given uh, the uh, definition of the kingdom uh, this weekend. We've been given the fundamentals of the fullness of the gospel. We've, been, we've talked about the vision to the kingdom. And those things were important to God that we talk about. I hope that you've been blessed by this day. And we've learned some things. Each time we've presented this, these presentations have changed just a little bit with, um, for clarity's sake. And you can see it's draft written across here. Our goal is uh, to have this in its final form and present it at conference to the whole body. Uh, in the meantime, I, I would hope that you, you take this, that you study it, that you make it a matter of prayer and make it a, a part of your life. And uh, I thank you for your patience with us and your endurance. Uh, may God bless you. Brother Larson, I don't know.